Hello and welcome to the third video in my series on getting through the PCT Sierra section. This video covers getting through the passes. In this video I'll go through each of the passes detailing their route and difficulty. I'll provide a summary table of the passes and discuss some strategies for getting through them. Please note that most of my descriptions and videos are for high snow conditions as that's what I experienced when going through in mid-May 2019. In high summer, most trails are switchbacks up to the passes and not technical. In spring and early summer, there'll be a combination of trail with switchbacks and snow. The section of the PCT this video relates to is the Sierra section shown in the yellow box. This section covers 315 miles from Kennedy Meadows South near mile 702 through to Sonora Pass at mile 1017. There are a total of 15 passes in the Sierra section, but in this video I'll not cover the first three, being Mulkey Trail and Cottonwood Passes, as they are barely noticeable as passes. The first pass is the highest pass, and it's the highest point on the PCT. This is Forrester Pass. Forrester Pass is 77 miles from Kennedy Meadows at mile 779.5. The pass is 13,200 feet high. The final approach is 623 feet over 0.9 of a mile with a gradient of 13%. The approach heads up a valley with a gentle gradient with the pass clearly visible in the distance. So you got the the rocky three and then there's a snow chute. That snow chute is where we're heading. Most of the year the snow chute below the pass is clearly visible from a distance. So there's zigzags up that snow there and then up onto the rocks onto the proper trail zigzagging up to the uh, final point of the pass. From the base of the climb, you go up a moderately steep snow slope before reaching a rocky area. This initial slope has a safe run out in the event of a slip. That is steep. Here's the rest of the group slowly making their way up. The trail then goes along steep, almost cliff-like rocks and the exposure is much steeper. And now we're heading up into a rocky area. So there's the uh, front of the group up there, um, and we're actually on the trail, um, switchbacking. <laughs> this is a nice wide bit, it's been a bit narrower. The trail then crosses a snow chute directly below the pass, and this part has long exposure and is pretty scary for many people. This is an area where several people have slipped and self-arrested. From there, there are a couple of type switchbacks up to the left of the pass. The pass is often corniced and hikers need to climb above the pass itself. This last part climbing above the pass was the steepest section when I did it and the scariest for the beginners. That's a fairly technical bit going up here, quite steep. We've just come along and then along below that cliff. Looks really impressive, it's not as bad as it looks. <laughs> There's Bird coming along. <laughs> so yeah, um, you, you definitely need to be uh, comfortable with heights. Um, but when you've got someone in front who's laying the trail, it makes it a bit easier. So here's the sign, um, and that's about 4,200 metres. From the pass, the descent has some steep sections and the key thing is to be sure to drop off the ridge before getting to the end where cliffs block the descent. But uh, woo -hoo -hoo. there's actually a lake down in that bowl, not that you can tell. <laughs> Glen Pass is 11.6 miles north of Forrester Pass at mile 791.1. The pass is 11,949 feet high. The final approach is 670 feet over 0.8 of a mile with a gradient of 16%. 
Glen Pass is a much easier pass technically, though when I did it there was one short steep section where care was needed for. While it's technically easier, it's still a long steep climb to get up to the pass. In the snow, the area is subject to avalanches and it is recommended to do it early before the snow loosens up. From the base of the ascent, which is by a lake when there's no snow, there's a long climb up a steep hill to a flatter section, which is another lake, and from there the pass comes into view. You traverse to the left of the lake, climbing steadily along the side of the hill, and then straight up a very steep hill to some rocks, before heading up and along the hill for the last steep part up to the pass. The exposure for this last part is steep and rocky. All right, I am at the top of Glen Pass. Woohoo! From the pass, the trail goes along the side of the hill, maintaining height for a little while before dropping straight down the steep side. Then it uh, goes along and it goes down the, uh, the valley. Pincho Pass is 16 miles north of Glen Pass at mile 807. The pass is 12,106 feet high. The final approach is 460 feet over 0.6 of a mile with a gradient of 14%. The trail climbs steadily from a small lake up a spur line which is deceptively steep before traversing across the slope climbing steeply up to the pass. The climb up and traverse have long exposures, relatively clear but there are a couple of rocks. I can't give much information on the descent as I was in near whiteout conditions and just headed downhill knowing I was dropping into a valley. I do not remember it being too difficult or too steep. Matha Pass is 10 miles north of Pinchot Pass at mile 817. The pass is 12,093 feet high. The final approach is 541 feet over 1.2 miles with a gradient of 8%. I was surprised that the gradient was so low and I had to double check the figures but it is correct. Um, I didn't realise at the time but it's actually quite a long approach as you go traverse across the hill underneath the pass before then turning and going up the steep bit. If you just take the final steep bit, um, the last 298 feet climb, the gradient increases to 11%, but it sure feels a lot steeper than that. Matha Pass has a reputation for being the scariest pass due to its steepness and exposure. The approach itself is a gentle continual climb until reaching the base of the final climb. From here, people tend to take two options, the left and the right. The right option more closely follows the actual PCT trail. The trail climbs a slope to gain some height before traversing left under the actual pass, climbing constantly. Once under the pass, the trail goes straight up on one of the steepest slopes I encountered on the PCT. There's usually a cornice on the pass and heavy snow, so it's necessary to climb up above the pass and then drop down onto it. This route is exposed to small avalanches and it's common to have footsteps covered over in the afternoons with mini avalanches. The other route going left is a constant, extremely steep climb up above the pass. This is more common when the snow has melted a little bit but still are not enough for the trail and switchbacks to be exposed. Oh wow, that was a very steep bit and we had to climb up and over the cornice and now we head down the rocks and then we're on the pass itself. Woohoo! That's where we've just come down after climbing up and uh, <laughs> You can see how steep that bit was getting up there. That was steep and then uh, coming down. See the trail heading down the hill, around, down, all the way down to that valley. And then continuing along to uh, those trees. <laughs> and stop. Mule Pass is 21 miles north of Matha Pass at mile 838. 
The pass is 11,696 feet high. The final approach is 243 feet over 0.4 of a mile with a gradient of 11%. Muir Pass is an easy non-technical climb with the climb up to the final ascent almost being steeper than the actual climb to the pass. I've come from that way um, and this is Helen Lake just in here. <laughs> All right, and the pass is up that way. Climb is moderately steep but non-technical. Near the top of the climb, the gradient eases as the shelter slowly comes into sight. There it is. There is the Muir shelter, which means I'm at the pass. Woohoo! Wow, that was hard work. The descent is a moderate grade down to Wander Lake. Selden Pass is 27 miles north of Muir Pass at mile 865. The pass is 10,912 feet high. The final approach is 302 feet over 0.6 miles with a gradient of 9%. From Hart Lake there's a gentle climb to the head of the valley and then a short steep climb up to the pass. This is one of the easier passes. Uh, this is Hart Lake and the pass is just around the corner up there. So that's the pass just beside the uh, skinny rock I think. When I did it I was following some footprints and the trail gradually climbed up the side of the valley to reach the pass instead of going to the head of the valley and then up. Still coming around underneath the cliffs. And up. I think this is the final climb to the pass. Yep. This is the top of uh, that little climb you just saw. And it looks like the pass is just around that little corner. Ooh, this is the pass. The descent is moderately steep but not technical. Silver Pass is 19 miles north of Selden Pass at mile 884. The pass is 10,781 feet high and the final approach is 276 feet over 0.5 of a mile with a gradient of 10%. Okay, so I think the pass is at the end of the valley. It's a, uh, a funny one where the pass isn't the highest point that we go over. It's marked on the map as a pass but we keep climbing up the hill just after it. And this is the final approach to the pass up there. This is the first pass, it's actually had trees on it. It's a bit lower. There you go. I think that's the pass there. Whew. So that's the direction that I have come from. I am currently on Silver Pass. Silver Pass is an easy pass up a gradual hill with only the final short section being a bit steeper. From the pass, there's actually more climbing to get to the higher point before starting the descent. The descent has a steep section, which eases off for a bit before another steep section. Island Pass is 39 miles north of Silver Pass at mile 924. The pass is 10,226 feet high. The final approach is 380 feet over 1.7 miles with a gradient of 4%. Island Pass is barely recognisable as a pass. From Thousand Island Lakes, the climb is steady and easy up to the flat plateau of the pass. From here, I am heading down and then up the valley behind this hill. Donahue Pass is five miles north of Island Pass at mile 929. The pass is 11,073 feet high. The final approach is 512 feet over 0.8 of a mile with a gradient of 12%. Donahue is another non-technical pass. It is a steady, long climb up a moderate slope. So that's the top of the pass just there. Okay, so the panorama, that is the way I've come. We're in this big snow bowl here. And then that's the way I'm going. We're heading down the valley. The first part of the descent is on a moderate slope. 
and then there's a steep drop down to the valley. The steep drop can be tackled by heading straight down, veering slightly right down a very, very steep slope, or veering slightly left to the head of a valley, which allows a gentler though still steep descent. That was a steep hill to come down. <laughs> came down there, and then uh, rather than where he's going, which is really steep, I went across um, where it was a bit more gentle and across here. But uh, wow. Looks like he's going down the steep bit. Get on him. Look how steep that slope is that he's about to go down. Benson Pass is 36 miles north of Donahue Pass at mile 966. The pass is 10,108 feet high. The final approach is 1,552 feet over 3 miles with a gradient of 10% come around the hill and now heading up still can't quite see the pass just around the corner Benson Pass it's going up and around these trees Benson Pass is another non-technical pass which involves a steady slog up a moderate slope Woohoo! Benson Pass oh, had to work for that one not technical but uh, pretty tough. From here, it's just following the valley down. Till I hit a big hill, then I turn right. Seavey Pass is nine miles north of Benson Pass at mile 975. The pass is 9,131 feet high. The final approach is 1,529 feet over three miles with a gradient of 10%. Seavey Pass is barely recognisable as a pass, but the approach is a steady slog from Benson Lake with a steep part before emerging into a area of lakes. I've just come up the uh, snow chute and here's a little lake, it's got no name, just small lake. Um, I'm gonna head around the side of it and then uh, sort of opposite this big feature here is CV Pass um, and then I drop down after that and a small climb up to a false pass before finally reaching the actual pass. Alright, so that one is CV Pass. You'll probably need to check your GPS to realise you're actually on the right pass. From here I go around to the left of this big rock and then there's a steep drop down to Ranchera Creek. Dorothy Lake Pass is 21 miles north of CV Pass at mile 997. The pass is 9,528 feet high. The final approach is 115 feet over 0.2 of a mile with a gradient of 11%. This is Dorothy Lake. And Dorothy Lake Pass is right at the end of it. The approach follows along the side of Dorothy Lake to the north end and then a very short moderate climb up to the pass. It's probably the, uh, the gentlest climbing of any of the passes that I've done. Um, out of sight now but there's a beautiful lake down there. The descent is moderate for 0.3 miles before dropping a little steeper down to Smedberg Lake. Here is a summary table showing all of the key information about the passes. I suggest pausing on it to uh, read it in a bit more detail. Now to the strategy for the passes. Your strategy will depend on the time of year that you're hiking. There are three main conditions encountered in the Sierra. Pre-thaw, thaw and post-thaw. Pre-thaw is up to mid to late May depending on yearly conditions. This time of year you'll have the advantage of firm snow, snow bridges over rivers and no crowds. The disadvantages are no people to help you if anything goes wrong, avalanche risk, low temperatures, navigation if there may be no trail, breaking trail through the fresh snow, closed resupply options and more chance of storms. Next is the thaw which is from late May through to mid-June depending on yearly conditions. At this time you'll have the advantage of more trail to walk on as the snow will have melted at the lower altitudes, trampled trails through the snow sections, more people to help in case of trouble, warmer temperatures, open 
resupply options and less chance of storms. The disadvantages are very high rivers, soft snow, avalanches, sun cups, post holing. Sun cups are bowl shaped open depressions on a snow surface. Often they have uh, sharp narrow ridges and then smooth concave hollows. And they form during the snow melting away. Post holing is when you break through the top layer of fresh snow and sink to unknown depths. This can be due to the top layer of snow freezing while the underneath is still soft or it could be due to air pockets below the snow which are usually near rocks, trees and deadfall. The last condition is the post melt which is usually from mid-June onwards. The advantage is of this time is that there is generally no snow except for maybe some small amounts on the highest points. This means travelling on established trails with little navigation requirements. The rivers will have dropped and there will be people around to assist in case of trouble. You'll also have the beauty of the flowers being in bloom and hiking through the lush green valleys. The main disadvantage is crowds as this is peak hiking season and the fact that this year will be just another section of trail instead of a winter wonderland or epic adventure. Uh, the other disadvantage is you will have plenty of company in the form of mosquitoes. Now for the strategy for getting through the passes for each of these different uh, conditions. For pre-thaw conditions, the considerations are not really for the passes it's more for getting through the Sierras with you needing snow skills and thinking about resupply but in terms of getting over the passes you don't need to think about it too much as the snow generally will remain firm most of the day and the rivers won't be as much of a problem as the snow won't have melted and there'll also be lots of snow bridges around however Unless you're starting really early, you will likely start transitioning to thaw conditions uh, before you're out of the Sierras, and you will need to take into account those considerations. For thaw conditions and some warmer pre-thaw days, these are the key considerations for getting over the passes. So the first one, camp at the foot of the pass so you set up for a nice early start. Which leads to the second one, which is cross passes early. Most people talk about going over the passes early in order to avoid post holing, but the more important reasons are related to safety as opposed to just making it easier. The key risk when the snow starts to warm up is avalanches. The other key safety considerations is the soft snow will cause unstable snow conditions for walking. Established footprints, which look secure, can actually slip away, um, causing hikers to slide. And if you're setting the steps yourself, um, it's very hard to compress the snow and have a stable footing. The next one is to have a minimum of one experienced person per group, especially in high snow conditions. Reading about hiking in the mountains is very different from actually being in the mountains. Also, while doing a mountain safety course is an excellent thing to do, and I strongly recommend it, it does take time in the mountains to be exposed to the different types of snow and conditions and to learn how to read them. It's especially important in reading the conditions for avalanche risk and cornice risk. And if you don't know what a cornice is, you don't fit into the experience category. I was actually horrified listening to a couple of people talking about how experienced they were and how they would lead their group through. But when I were asked what their strategy for cornices was, they just looked at me blankly and had no clue what I was talking about. It. It's not a major issue um, on the PCT apart from on the passes, but you should still be aware of the risks. The next strategy is make sure the slowest and or least experienced people are not at the back of the group. Ideally, a group will have the, one of the most experienced people at the front 
picking the safest route and another experienced person at the back so they can keep an eye on the least experienced people reminding them of technique and are able to move forward if these people get into difficulty the next consideration is take your time if you need to stop early in order to set up for an early start in the morning then do this rather than risk a potentially unsafe pass crossing if an inexperienced person needs coaching and want to take their time using their ISAX um, uh, for security, then let them, regardless of how slow it seems. Related to giving the inexperienced person um, time is don't leave people behind. Um, I heard some horror stories of groups that went in and the experienced people were getting frustrated with the slow people and they left them. And that left a bunch of um, inexperienced people trying to make their way through the snow. Um, the next consideration is practice self-arrest regularly. This is a skill that needs to become instinctive. When sliding down a mountain, you don't have time to try and remember what you need to do. It needs to just happen. I also recommend practice self-arresting with hiking poles, as slips often happen where people are not concentrating and haven't thought that the slope is serious enough to need an ice axe. Um, my slip in the Sierras happened um, as I was getting tired at the end of the day and I was just on a, a normal slope and I needed to arrest with my hiking pole. Um, the next one is to take time and stop and appreciate the beauty of the Sierra. Um, it, it's hard work, it's tiring, it's challenging, but it's also absolutely spectacular. Um, yeah, the, the Sierra is just an amazing place to be. Um, so those are recommendations, but in terms of actually how to approach the passes um it's one of those it depends on the conditions and it depends on your experience and it depends on your speed um a lot of people aim to do a pass a day um but it just depends how fast you're traveling um as an example um this is my schedule in high snow conditions um, I was hiking by myself so setting my own trail I had footprints to follow uh, for the first pretty much into Mammoth probably 80% of the time um, but nothing to follow after Mammoth um, I had good snow nice and firm until Mammoth and then it was into the thaw soft slushy post holing high rivers so it's just an example of getting through the passes um, slower people um, you may not even be able to do a pass a day um, you may find that you're not going to have enough time to get to the foot of the next pass and you may need to just have half a day only to set yourself up to go over the paths the next day in conclusion, uh, the challenges of the Sierra Passes will change depending on the conditions when you go through, um, but be flexible with your plans, consider the weather and snow conditions, and adjust for your own and your group's abilities and experience. Regardless of when you go through, you'll be blown away by the majestic beauty of the Sierra Nevada and it's likely to end up one of the biggest highlights of your PCT experience. Woohoo! Beautiful views every direction.
Um, there's no need for any particular path strategy in post thaw conditions as you will just be following the trail on the switchbacks.